Yes. And we're now going to start to um, add some some thoughts to these lines and prepare to um, get to the point where before the week's over we can set forth the sequence of events of the fourth angel, the latter end time period, and also um, identify what is represented by the opening up of the seventh seal. Um, the title of this is Three Parallel Lines. We're going to look at three passages from God's Word and identify that they're representing the three histories that are the same histories, they're just um, parallel representations of the histories. That's Revelation 14, Matthew 25, and Revelation 10. Um, from the 1888 materials, page 803 of says, we are God's commandment keeping people. For the past 50 years, every phase of heresy has been brought to bear upon us to cloud our minds regarding the teaching of the word, especially concerning the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and the message of heaven for these last days, as given by the angels of the 14th chapter of Revelation. Messages of every order and kind have been urged upon Seventh-day Adventists to take the place of truth, which point by point has been sought out by prayerful study and testified to by the miracle-working power of the Lord. But the waymarks which have made us what we are are to be preserved, and they will be preserved, as God has signified through his word and the testimony of his spirit. He calls us to hold firmly with the grip of faith to the fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. If you look at this line here, which is the Millerite history, and she's talking about Revelation 14 at this point, the first, second, and third angel's message. In 1840, the first angel's message is in power. 1842, the second angel's message arrives when the four Protestant churches close their doors against the Millerites. In 1844, the third angel's message arrives. So when she's talking about preserving these waymarks, um, and that they will be preserved. One of the things she's emphasizing is that where these truths arrive in history and their relationship to one another must be preserved because as you've seen, you haven't seen it applied yet, but you're understanding the logic no doubt. It's this it's these waymarks in this reform movement that is going to illustrate the events of the latter reign in Revelation 18 without the cry. They have to be preserved if we're going to understand this history. And when it comes to prophetic lines, the way marks, Jamal mentioned this um, once today that I heard. When you bring this line upon this line and this line upon these lines, it is not a requirement that every way mark is illustrated. Jamal has pointed it out a couple of times so far. That the line of Daniel 2, identifying the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, begins with Babylon. The line of Daniel 7, identifying the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, begins with Babylon. But the line of chapter 8, which is identifying the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, begins with the Medo Persia. But we don't need to see Babylon in, in chapter 8 because it's already been established by chapter 2 and chapter 7. But when it comes to these lines, you don't have to see every waymark illustrated. All you have to do is see the waymark illustrated two or three times, and then it's established. What you do have to see is that the order is identical. If I'm going to tell you that this line is a parallel to this line, but on this line, the order is 3, 1, 2, and this order is 1, 2, 3, then there's something wrong with it. The, the sequence has to be identical, even if some of the waymarks are missing. The word waymark, the waymark, can you the word waymark? Well, I, I've used waymarks because Sister White uses that, and and so I, when I first began using that, I went to the Ellen White, or to the Webster's Dictionary of Ellen White's Day and Age, and waymarks means marks along the way. Um, so we defined, at our first presentation last night, we defined prophecy, and you'll find it in the first presentation under prophecy defined, but she says, Historical events were set before the people, and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. So, 
when she says prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation, the word delineation from Webster's Dictionary of the Common High Day and Age means to set forth upon a line. Prophecy is set forth upon a line, and these historical events that are placed upon the line are illustrating the fulfillment of prophecy. But once they're on this line, they're way marks. And in the line of Millerite history, the first angel's message was empowered in 1840. Second angel's message, and, and you'll notice, there's, I don't know, it's probably too early to deal with this, but it, this might help you if you're just struggling with these concepts. The first angel's message, in actuality, if you want to make the case, at the time of the end in 1798, you can say the first angel's message arrived there. It certainly wasn't recognized. It, it, it's this increase of knowledge that is going to be the first angel's message. And finally, Miller is used to put it into a package. And then the first angel's message here is in power when the angel of Revelation 10 comes down. So what I want you to see, one of the characteristics of all these messages, is the message comes into history, and it moves through history for a while, and then it is in power. So when the Protestant church is closing the doors against the Millerites in June of 1842, that's when it arrived in history. But when is it that the second angel's message is in power? It's in power in the midnight cry in the summer of 1844. So the third angel's message arrived in history in 1844, but when is it in power? It's in power when the fourth angel down here comes and joins it. So one of the characteristics of all these angels is they're they arrive in history, they proceed through history, and then at some point in time, they're in power. But in any case, they are way more to have to be preserved. Second paragraph. But since the General Conference of 1888, Satan has been working with special power through unconsecrated elements to weaken the confidence of God's people in the voice that has been appealing to them for these many years. If he can succeed in this, then through misapplication of Scripture, he will lead many to cast away their confidence in the past work under the messages. Thus he would set them adrift with no solid foundation for their faith, hoping to bring them fully under his power. Let the attention of our people be called to the special work of the Spirit of God as it has been connected with the rise and progress of the three messages, and a blessing will resort to the whole body. The revival of faith and interest in the testimonies of the Spirit of God will lead to the obtaining of a healthful experience in the things of God. Now, one of the things she's saying in here is if, if, if we lose track of, of these messages, what they mean, when they came in history, the relationship to one another, that we're going to be set adrift. And I, I sense, I haven't actually heard Dwayne's full presentation that he started, but I sense, because I have communicated with him on this subject, that he's going to intend to use these charts to connect with this history, which you, you can do very well. And it uh, <clears throat> seems like that's what he was saying um, at one point today. And when you use this chart that, that came into existence in, 18, in March of 1842 and is a summary of Millerite thinking at that time period, um, then it, it's a component of this, this history. And what Sister Wright is saying here, if we, if we can somehow be led to set away this history, um, then we're going to be adrift in our understanding of the final warning message. And brothers and sisters, without taking the time to, to prove this to you, if, if you're incorrect on the daily, then you're incorrect on 508. All right? If you teach as we teach now that the daily is Christ sanctuary ministry, um, Christ began the sanctuary ministry in, in AD 31. Okay? So this date is incorrect. If that's what you teach about the daily. So you, you cut away this way mark, but in doing so, 508 is the starting point for these two time prophecies. So when you cut, this, cut loose of this, you're cutting loose of this. And as Jamal pointed out, if you cut loose of this, then the question in Daniel 8, 13, how long should be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give up the sanctuary of both be trodden underfoot, and the answer is verse 14, 1844. If you cut loose of this date, and you identify the daily as Christ's sanctuary ministry, then you have to start, the earliest that you can start the 2300-year prophecy is in 1831, so you destroy 
the 2300 day prophecy. And I have an email from the Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, where they say, we no longer accept the 2520, so this is gone. And they add on to the email that they no longer accept the pioneer position of the trumpets, okay? So whether, whether Adventism understands it or not, we're, we're drift. We're cut loose of, of this history because the, the arrival of these messages, the empowerment of the first angel's message is a prophecy that's here in this trumpet. All right, you throw this trumpet out and you cut loose of this way mark that we're supposed to preserve. So when she's telling us this here, for, this is <coughs> for you others, they're not accepting even at that point, none of this. Will be yeah, but not, uh, don't misunderstand me. Mm -hmm. They will still tell you that it's most certainly they're not going to deny that they believe in the 2300 year prophecy. But what I'm telling you, if you're going to get technical and, and demand that they prove it, they cannot can no longer prove it. It's, they, they've taken positions that are unsustainable. Um, but in any case, let's read on. Some of those who are newly come to the faith claim to have special light from God in regard to these messages, that their new light leads them to set aside the established truths that are the pillars of the faith. They misinterpret and misapply the scriptures. They misplace the messages of Revelation 14 and set aside the work which these messages have accomplished. They, thus they reject the great way marks which God himself has established, since their new light leads them to tear down the structure which the Lord has built up. We may know that he is not guiding them. This experience of those newly come to the faith that the Lord is working upon their minds will be in harmony with the word of God and with his past dealings with his people and the instruction he has given them. He will not contradict himself. Brother and sister, <coughs> Sister Wright said, the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. She said, the Lord held his hand over some of the figures in this chart until his hand was removed. And then in the same book, in early writings, and that's the page not in the forefront of my mind, but in early writings, she tells us what the mistake what was that the Lord held his hand over, and it was 1843. Okay. And, but she says some of the figures, so some might say figures in the plural, well, the pioneers thought the 2300 year prophecy ended in 1843, they thought the 2520 ended in 1843. They were bought wrong on both those figures because they both ended in 1844. My point is, there are some that take the statement where she says, the Lord held his hand over a mistake in some of the figures and say all of this is wrong, but Sister White in the same book says the only thing that's wrong is 1843. And then she had her husband, by vision, make this chart to correct 1843. And she says that God is in the publishment of this chart mm -hmm. and that there's a prophecy of it in the Bible. So this, this is sacred ground. This is mm -hmm. sacred ground and he doesn't contradict himself. Last paragraph. God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in the line of prophecy. And I started here on the thoughts the, the first presentation acknowledging that there is a true way to identify the, the theology of the three angels' messages. What does it mean to fear God? What does it mean to give him glory? What does it mean that the hour of his judgment has come? What is the everlasting gospel? Those are true and correct presentations of the three angels' messages. I'm not denying that. But here and other places, Sister White isn't emphasizing the doctrinal understanding of Revelation 14. She's emphasizing their location as waymarks in the prophetic history that they arrived in. God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in the line of prophecy, and their work is not to close till the close of this earth's history. The first and second angel's message are still true for this time and are to run parallel with that which follows. And this is what I was suggesting in the question and answers with Pastor Gonzalez, this particular quote. She says, the first and second angels' messages are still truths for this time and are to run parallel with that which follows. 
And the first angel's message, if you mark its conclusion when the second angel's message arrives in June of 1842, comes to here, and then it, the second angel's <coughs> message ends when the third arrives on October 22nd, 1844. So Sister White is saying, that which follows the first and second angel's message is to run parallel with it. And what we're saying is, according to the, the model that we've been identifying in every reform movement, from 1798 you had the time of the end, 1833, the Lord formalizes the message based upon the increase of knowledge, and then in 1840, he empowers the message, and basically all we've been saying so far is that when the mighty angel of Revelation 10 came down, he empowered the message. But brothers and sisters, that's not all that happened. Because in Revelation 10, when the angel comes down, and we'll have the quote in here in the notes, we'll get to it at some point in time, where Sister White comments on Revelation 10. She tells us the angel that comes down is no less a person than Jesus Christ, and that the little book that's open in his hand is the book of Daniel, and the fact that he put one foot upon the land and one foot upon the sea represents a worldwide message. And so we have the comments on that, and when we look at Revelation 10, an angel can, comes to John and tells him, and some of your eyes are closing. Can't do that. And you have to keep your eyes open. This is the hardest meeting. And it wasn't just one person, so don't feel real nervous. <laughs> the angel tells John to go take the book from the, the angel, go take the little book of Daniel from Christ and eat it, and it will be sweet in your mouth. And when you take the time to look at Jeremiah and Ezekiel, who also eat the little book, it represents when the prophet is giving a testing message that he is to carry to God's people. All right? Jeremiah, Ezekiel both teach that when the little book is open. There, the Lord says, I'll make your forehead as flint, because you're taking this message not to a people of strained speech, but to my people who understand your language, and they're a hard-headed, stiff-necked people, and I'm going to make your forehead as flint, because they're not going to receive this message. When a prophet eats the little book, it marks a testing process. So in 1840, not only is the message empowered, the testing of the Millerites uh, begins here in earnest. And then in 1842, the second angel's message arrives. It's empowered in the midnight cry. And it concludes in 1844. And Sister White says, that which follows the first and second angel's message is to run parallel with it. And what we're saying is, is that there is a time at the end in the reform movement of the 144,000. There's a fulfillment of prophecy that sheds light upon this history. That's the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. And that this is the third angel's message. And the third angel's message, it began in 1844. So if we're going to run this parallel, we're acknowledging that the third angel's message began back here in 1844. And but all the messages they go through history and at some point they're in power. So the third angel's message that began back here in 1844 is going through history, but it's going to parallel this history. So she says that which follows the first and second angel's message is going to run parallel with it. So we get to 1989 and we find we find that this is what this is what's really interesting to note, brothers and sisters. We need to test this one. You need to make sure. If what I'm saying here is true or false, but if you find that it is true, then it should blow your mind. This one blew my mind. Verse 40 of Daniel 11 begins, it says, and at the time of the end. And Sister White in Great Controversy says the time of the end is 1798. So 1798 is the time of the end for the Millerites. And it's identified in Daniel 11, verse 40, but the verse goes on to describe the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, and that's the time of the end for the 144,000, and the time of the end for the Millerites, and the time of the end for the 144,000 is in this very same verse in Scripture, Daniel 11, 40. Wow. <laughs> if that's true, you need to understand. It isn't an accident. In any case, there's an increase of knowledge that begins just like every reform movement because that's what, which follows the first and second angel's message. The first here, the second here, 
is to run parallel with it. And what we're saying is, is that on 2001, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down and joined this message and empowered it parallel to myths. Now, brothers and sisters, what Mark says for the Millerites is the fulfillment of the prophecy from a world trumpet. And what we're saying this is, is the fulfillment of the third world trumpet. What empowers the Millerites empowers the 144,000. Okay? And then we should expect to see this is worldwide. This was worldwide. Everyone in the world knows about this. This was an action of the Protestants in the United States. The next thing we should expect to see is an action of the Protestants in the United States. Now, brothers and sisters, we've been emphasizing that all these reform movements are governed by the work of the Holy Spirit. And the work of the Holy Spirit is threefold. It's to convict of sin. Are, are, are you saying that uh, since 2000, the letter rain starts pouring in God's feet? Amen. Yeah. Amen. What? You know, I, I'm... No, 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 I can't get it. You've got to write it down. And we, and, and, uh, the reason that I won't take that question right now is because we specifically address this. All I'm doing here is doing this preliminary. This is going to be addressed. <laughs> yeah. Let, let me do the for me. I say amen for us. Well, uh, I say amen. I say amen that too for me too. I say that but because many people doesn't believe that in 2001, all the spirit stopped praying that people. Yeah, most people don't. Don't do it. Okay. Um, these reform movements are governed by a three step process of the Holy Spirit to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Correct? Miller's message here was a message that convicted sin. In the history of the second angel's message, righteousness was manifested in the, in the midnight cry. And it led to the judgment of 1844. Now, the brother here, he says amen, that we're saying in 2001, the latter rain begins to spring. And I say amen too, but amen. brothers and sisters, there's never been a more serious message given to mankind. Adventism is now confronted with the reality of you either wake up or die. There's no more time. This is the time period. The only thing we can be doing as Seventh-day Adventists now is sending our sins beforehand to judgment in order that they be blotted out that we might receive the refreshing. If we refuse to do that, now we are lost for eternity and we're preparing for the mark of the beast. My point is this. This message, correctly understood, is a reform message that convicts of sin. And when it reaches its conclusion here at the Sunday Law in the United States, when once again it's an action of the Protestants of the United States, the loud cry begins in earnest and righteousness, the righteousness of Christ is manifested and it concludes when Michael stands up and judgment ends. All right. So when she says that which follows the first and second angel's message is to run parallel with it. Brothers and sisters, it does and it is. It's happened. When you come to this the next page, page 48. When you come to Revelation 14 and Revelation 18, it's dealing with angels. And Sister Wright is very clear that the angels represent the work that the people of God do. So when we're talking about the three angels' messages and the fourth angels' message, we're not talking about literal angels. We're just speaking about the work that is accomplished by God's people during those particular histories. You have a couple of quotes here on the top of the page. I'm not going to take time to read them. I'm already um, running fall far behind. In the middle of this page, it says Matthew 25 and Revelation 14 connected. What I'm doing here, among one thing, is I'm trying to give you the line of Revelation 14, and I'm going to try to show you that this is the same line as Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, that they are to be understood in relationship to one another, in connection with one another. And I'm going to, we're going to read some, a passage where Sister Mike ties them together. 
Near the close of the second angel's message, I saw great light from heaven shining upon the people of God. The rays of this light seemed bright as the sun, and I heard the voices of angels crying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. This was the midnight cry which gave power to the second angel's message. You see? Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, is directly connected <coughs> with Revelation 14, the three angels' message. They are parallel lines of prophecy. The, the difference, the difference, and there is difference, is the Lord, of all these lines of prophecy, one thing to always remind yourself is that the Lord never repeats things just to say the same thing. Every time he teaches another line, he's trying to teach a different aspect of the truth. With Revelation 14, it's the same line of prophecy as Matthew 25, but Revelation 14 is speaking about the work that the people of God do. In this history of Revelation 14 and Revelation 18, what those two passages in scriptures are, are emphasizing is the work that is accomplished by God's people. Whereas, Matthew 25, which is the same history, it's not talking about the work that is accomplished by God's people. It's speaking about the experience of God's people. If you turn to the next page, on the Great Controversy, page 393, it says, Top of page 49 in the notes, the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Advent people. So Revelation 14 is a parallel to Matthew 25, but Revelation 14, the angels are talking about the work that's accomplished in that history, and Matthew 25 is talking about the experience of God's people during that time period. So the work and the experience are related, but they're different. Now if you back up to the previous page, when I when I read the quote about the first and second angels' messages are still truth for this time and are to run parallel with that which follows, what I was trying to identify for us is that the, the history represented by Revelation 14 is repeated. Okay? It's repeated in Revelation 18. So, so when it comes to the three angels' messages, prophecy teaches that the three angels' messages are repeated at the end of the world. If you follow my logic, say amen. Yeah. But Matthew 25 is a, a second line to that same history, and here we're going to read that Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, is also repeated. Bottom of page 48 from Review and Carol, August 19, 1890, she says, When the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation and it becomes an abiding influence. It must be attended with divine power or it will accomplish nothing. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins five of whom were wise, and five foolish. This parable has been and will be repeated to the fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application this time, like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. So not only are Matthew, is Matthew 25 and Revelation 14 parallel lines of prophecy, inspiration identifies that they both are repeated at the end of the world. The line of Revelation 10 on page 49, under the mighty angel, I refer to this passage. This is a passage where Sister White comments on Revelation 10, um, and we will refer to this a great deal. Uh, this is where she says that the angel of Revelation 10 is no less the personage of Christ than Christ, and that the book in his hand is the book of Daniel. So that's, that's in there for a point of reference, but let's move beyond that. In that passage, he says that the, the fact that Christ set his foot upon the land and on the sea is demonstrating the part that he plays in this history. Another part of the passage, he says the fact that he puts his foot upon the land and the sea represents a worldwide message, but here she's saying that it's emphasizing the part that Christ plays. Revelation 14 is emphasizing the work that is accomplished by God's people. Matthew 25 is the same history, but it's emphasizing the experience of God's people. Revelation 10 is the same history, but it's emphasizing the part that Christ plays in this history. Three parallel lines, but three different aspects of those history. Revelation 10 is about Christ, the line of the tribe of Judah. It's all about Christ, which is really being emphasized here. Now you'll notice... In Revelation 10, verse 3, this is where we're going to begin to look at this. Um, in Revelation 10, verse 3, it says, And 
the angel, Christ, cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, earlier, um, I referred to at some point in time here today, that in Revelation 22, and this is in your notes, verse 11, we have the close of probation. And just before the close of probation, in verse 10, which is in your notes, there's a pronouncement, and he said, and it says, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Just before the close of probation, there comes a pronouncement that the time is at hand to unseal the prophecy in the book of Revelation that has been sealed up. And the only prophecy in the book of Revelation that is sealed up is the prophecy of the seven thunders in Revelation chapter 10. And when, when in verse 3, Christ cries as a lion, it says he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, um, there's only one other place in the book of Revelation where Christ is portrayed as a lion. And where is that? That's in Revelation chapter 5, where Christ is portrayed as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 5, but turn there, and then, then I want to read this quote before we look at it. From Testimonies, volume 9, in your notes on page 50, Testimonies, volume 9, page 267 says, The fifth chapter of Revelation needs to be closely studied. It is of great importance to those who shall act a part in the work of God for these last days. There are some who are deceived. They do not realize what is coming upon the earth. Now, i I got to just keep moving forward, but I killed a little bit of time. I shouldn't have done here. Um, <coughs> Revelation chapter 5, in verse 1, it says this, And I saw him. In, in chapter 4, John has entered into the courtroom scene, and he sees God the Father sitting upon the throne. He has a book in his hand, and sealed with seven seals. Verse 1 of chapter 5, John is carrying on uh, a description of this event. And he says, And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And brothers and sisters, these seven seals are there's truths about these seven seals that were not recognized by the pioneers of Adventism that it is absolutely present truth in this day and age. So when Sister White says this chapter is something we need to understand, uh, Lord willing, when we leave this meeting, we'll understand at least part of why she was saying that. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Now take notice. For some reason, John is put under. John becomes part of the prophecy, and he's he's under such conviction that whatever this book is, it's so important that it's open so that men can read it. That when he realizes that no one can open, all he can do is weep. All right, and you got to put that in the back of your mind. You've got to put that in the back of your mind. We're going to deal with that later on this week. That when John sees this book that's sealed up, he weeps because no one's able to open it. All right? Because this history is fulfilled in the history of the Millerites. And it's repeated at the end of the world. So he weeps much in verse 4. And then in verse 5 it says, and one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Here's Christ is the lion. And Sister White specifically identifies the lion of the tribe of Judah is Christ. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. Christ has prevailed at the cross. In fact, um, a careful analysis of this, Revelation 4 and 5, is identifying an event that took place when? Anyone have a thought of when this takes place? Yes, it takes place at Pentecost. Mm -hmm. This is a part of the inauguration of the holy place. When Christ ascended and uh, the Father acknowledged that he received his work, this is the Pentecostal ceremony that's going on. And how did Christ let the followers on earth know that uh, this event was being marked? 
by pouring out the Spirit on Pentecost. So this is a this is a significant event in sacred history. And one of the things that Christ achieved at the cross is he achieved the, the writer, the authority, however you want to express it, to be the one that opens the book that is sealed with seven seals. So we have to um, understand what this book is. And, this is. and we'll get back to Revelation 10 in a moment. <clears throat> Under the line of the tribe of Judah, on the bottom of page 50, it says, It was the line of the tribe of Judah who unsealed the book and gave to John the revelation of what should be in these last days. Daniel stood in his lot to bear his testimony, which was sealed until the time of the end, when the first angel's message should be proclaimed to our world. These matters are matters are of infinite importance in these last days. But while many shall be purified and made white and white and tried, the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand. Brothers and sisters, as we read through these passages in Revelation 5, we're going to see that Christ begins to open the seals one at a time. But Sister White is here telling us that even though Christ is portrayed here in chapters 4 and 5 at Pentecost in the holy place, in the, the celebration of Pentecost that's going on in the heavenly sanctuary, in the holy place, at that day, in reality, when he begins to open the seals, he begins to open it in 1798, when the first angel's message should be proclaimed to the world. In fact, this, Sister White says, the, the same line of prophecy that's taken up in Revelation is taken up in Daniel. They're the same book. She says they bring each other to perfection. And in Daniel 12, Daniel's told, seal up your book until when? The time of the end. When's the time of the end? So the unsealing of the book of Daniel is what Christ is doing here in chapter 6 onward as he unseals the book that's sealed with seven seals. He is the one that's responsible for bringing about this increase of knowledge that's going to do, it's going to do several things. It's going to test this generation, right, among other things. So, and the testing process is specifically identified here by Sister White in terms of Revelation or Daniel 12. The wicked won't understand it, but the wise will. So how is it that the Bible, that the book of Daniel was sealed up? Turn to the next page, page 51. When Christ came to this earth, the traditions that have been handed down from generation to generation and the human interpretation of scriptures hid from men the truth as it is in Jesus. The truth was buried beneath the mass of tradition, the spiritual import of the sacred volumes. Brothers and sisters, what is the sacred volume? The Bible. The Bible. The, Bible. The, the spiritual import of the sacred volumes was lost, for in their unbelief men locked the door of the heavenly treasure. Darkness covered the earth, and great darkness the people. Truth looked down from heaven to earth, but nowhere was revealed the divine impress. A gloom like a pall of death overspread the earth, but the lion of the tribe of Judah prevailed. He opened the book, the, the seal that closed the book of divine instruction. What's the book of divine instruction? So what's the book that's in the Father's hand that sealed the seven seals. Wow. It's the Bible. Right? And who opens it? Christ. Christ. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. What sealed it up? Traditions and human, human interpretation of scriptures that had been handed down from generation to generation had sealed it up. The world was permitted to gaze upon pure, unadulterated truth. Truth itself descended to rule back the darkness and counteract the air. A teacher was sent from heaven with the light that was to light every man that comes into the world. There were men and women who were eagerly seeking for knowledge. And what is knowledge? Sure. The sure word of prophecy. And Daniel 12 speaks about an increase of knowledge. And Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. What are they destroyed from? From a lack of understanding the sure word of prophecy. The next quote, talking about how the Bible is sealed up from Signs of the Times, May 17, 1905. The scribes and Pharisees profess to explain, explain the scriptures, but they explain them in accordance with their own ideas and traditions. Their customs and maxims became more and more exacting. In a spiritual sense, the sacred volume, the sacred word, became to the people as a sealed book, closed to their comprehension. In the time of the Savior, the Jews had so covered over the precious jewels of truth. Now, please take note. They covered over the precious jewels of truth. You may not remember this. 
until I remind you of it, or Jamil reminds you of it, um, Jamal. I hang around with the people in London too long. <laughs> Forgive me if I've been saying Jamil. That's how they say it in London, and it's Jamal. Uh, in the time of the Savior, but anyway, when we get to this point further on this week, we're going to re- point out the jewels, okay? In the time of the Savior, the Jews had so covered over the precious jewels of truth with the rubbish of tradition and fable that it was impossible to distinguish the truth, the truth from the false. The Savior came to clear away the rubbish of superstition and long-cherished error and to set the jewels of God's word in the framework of truth. What would the Savior to do? What would the Savior do if he should come to us now as he did to the Jews? He would have to do a similar work in clearing away the rubbish of tradition and ceremony. The Jews were greatly disturbed when he did this work. They had lost sight of the original truth of God, but Christ brought it again to view. It is our work to free the precious truth of God from superstition and error. Amen. What a work is committed to us in the gospel. An angel's pen could not portray all the glory of the revealed plan of redemption. And she uses these terms more than once to describe the sealing up and the bearing of the truth through traditions and customs that are handed down from generation to generation. And then in our next book, she's talking about the light being brought out during the Reformation, the last sentence, top of page 52, from the Union Herald, November 22, 1892. They, the Reformers, began diligently to work the mind of truth to clear away the rubbish of human opinion that had buried up the precious jewels of life. Um, and then there's a similar quote underneath that. So what we're saying is, if you go back to Revelation 10, verse 4, verse 3. For a student of prophecy, Sister White clearly tells us that the angel that comes down out of heaven in verse 1 of Revelation 10 is no less a person than in Jesus Christ. So when Jesus Christ gets to verse 3, it says, And Jesus cried with a loud voice as when a lion roared. As when a lion roared. And the only other place in Revelation that is illustrated as a lion as is, is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when it's illustrated as the lion of the tribe of Judah, it is symbolizing his work in unsealing the truths of God's word that have been covered up through traditions and customs that have been handed down from generation to generation. That's what's represented, connected with his work as the lion. So when you get to verse 4, it says, verse 3 says, And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars, and when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. This is the passage that is sealed up, that is unsealed, just before probation closes in Revelation 22 11. Who unseals it just before probation closes? The line of the tribe of Judah. In the Millerite history, in 1798, the book of Daniel was unsealed. And what happened? They began a process of separating the wise and foolish virgins of the Millerite history. How was that process, process of separation accomplished? Through an increase of knowledge, an escalating but, but if, you, if you didn't catch what Dwayne was saying this morning, I'm not sure that you did. Progressive revelation. Is that the term that you were quoting from Dan C? It was progressive revelation. And if you didn't catch it, some people that are, are unwilling to acknowledge the 2520 of, as a foundational truth, they're not aware of what Brother Dwayne said this morning. The first time prophecy that William Miller discovered was the 2520. And it was from the 2520 that he was led to the 2300 year prophecy. Amen. See, it was a, he didn't learn, he, did, he didn't learn about the daily. William Miller is the man in history that identifies the daily as paganism. The Lord yeah. used him to do that. But he didn't learn all these truths simultaneously. It was a progressive revelation, and that progressive revelation is the increase of knowledge that tested this generation. Okay. Um, and that's going to be repeated at the end. There isn't going to be just one piece of prophetic light that surfaces when the seven thunders are unsealed at the end of time, and that tests 
God's people, it's going to be a progressive development of truth and increase of knowledge, which has already begun. So what is the seven thunders in the, in the um, center of page 52? And this, these are, I'm taking these quotes right out off of the entire quote on page 49. We have the entire quote from Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 971, on page 49 of your notes. But in this center of page 52, I've selected two statements out of that passage where Sister White tells us what the seven thunders are. The seven thunders, whatever they represent, have been sealed up. But just before probation closes, they are to be unsealed. The special light given to John, which was expressed in the seven thunders, was a delineation of what the incident would transpire under the first and second angel's message. Brothers and sisters, the seven thunders is a delineation of events that transpires from 1798 to 1844. And if you have been following what Future for America teaches for any amount of time, you, will, you might stumble right there because I have been teaching for quite some time that the seven hundreds represent the events from 1840 to 1844. I stay corrected. I, now, now that I have the light on the unsealing of the seventh seal, I can, I can stand with some of my brethren who have been saying for quite some time that the seven hundreds represent the events from 1798 to 1844. I get it now, they're right. And we'll try to demonstrate that as we proceed. It's a delineation of events that transpire under the first and second angel's messages, and technically the first angel arrives here when the book begins to be unsealed. Okay? But in the same passage, she also says this. And after these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John and to Daniel in regard to the little book. Now take notice, brothers and sisters, she's marking here that the sealing up of the seven thunders is just like the sealing up of the book of Daniel. <clears throat> She's the one that's drawing the comparison. She's saying the sealing up of the seven thunders, she says the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book. And Daniel was told what in Daniel chapter 12? Seal up the book until the time of the end. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. These relate to future events that will be disclosed in their order. So the seven thunders represent two histories. The history of the first and second angel's message from 1798 to 1844 and the history of the raising up of the 144,000. The prophetic line of Revelation 10 is a parallel line to Revelation, to Revelation 14 and it's a parallel line to Matthew 25. Revelation 14 is emphasizing the work that God's people accomplished. Matthew 25 is emphasizing the experience of God's people in that history. And Revelation 10 is identifying the role that Christ plays in that history. But they're all three parallel lines of prophecy. And when you look closely, inspiration tells us of each of those lines that they are all repeated at the end of the world. Revelation 14 is repeated at the end. Revelation 10 is repeated at the end. Matthew 25 is repeated at the end. And this is the prophetic truth I don't know if I should say this. I should probably think about it before I say it. This is the prophetic truth that parallels the year day principle for the way of There was there was a there was a, a rule that was the primary rule for the Millerites, and it was the year day principle. And the obvious key that the Lord gives to the hundred and forty four thousand at the end of time is the recognition, the understanding that the Millerite history is repeated. Because once you understand that, you can open the whole word of God. That is the key that allows you to take these reformation lines and bring them together line upon line, is the truth that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world. And brothers and sisters, we now understand that. You know what that means? That the line of tribe of Judah has unsealed that principle to God's people. And it means that the next thing to happen is verse 11 of Revelation 22, which is the close of probation. This is an exciting truth. Is a serious truth because this truth is unsealed just before probation closes, just before the pronouncement comes. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Notice, um, Brother Dwayne referenced a little bit of this at the bottom of page 52, speaking of William Miller. Early writings, page 229. 
God sent his angel to move upon the heart of a farmer who had not believed the Bible to lead him to search the prophecies. I'm sure that we're all aware that the reason that William Miller began to study the Bible wasn't because he was a devout Christian. He was determined that he was going to demonstrate that the Bible was erroneous. And that was where he started. But God sent an angel to move upon his heart. Angels of God repeatedly visited that chosen one to guide his mind and open to his understanding prophecies which had ever been dark to God's people. Amen. Brothers and sisters, angels led William Miller to reach some of these conclusions. To bring these things to light that had been dark because they'd been sealed up by traditions and customs that had been handed down from generation to generation until 1798 when the lion of the tribe of Judah began to unseal these truths. Next quote, angels of God accompanied William Miller in his mission. He was firm and undaunted, fearlessly proclaiming the message committed to his trust. And the next quote from Great Controversy 336, it says, The instigator of all evils sought not only to counteract the effect of the Advent movement, but to destroy the messenger himself. William Miller was the messenger of the Advent movement. That's why in history they call him the Millerites. Right? He was the messenger just as John the Baptist was the messenger, just as Noah was, as Moses was as a Bible was. In Great Controversy, page 333, it says, In 1833, two years after Miller began to present in public the evidences of Christ's soon coming, the last of the signs appeared, which were promised by the Savior as tokens of his second advent. William Miller is ultimately going to announce uh, his predictions, the Millerite predictions are going to announce that the Lord was going to return in 1844, correct? Initially it's 1843, but ultimately 1844. William Miller receives, receives his credentials to preach in 1833, which is the, the time period of the falling of the star. And I would submit to you that they were working under the Karaite reckoning of time, the biblical reckoning of time, which had the years ending, ending not on December 31st, but they end on March 21st. And we're talking about 1833. 1833 actually projects in to 1844. Do you follow my logic? Do you, do you follow my logic? Okay. So, one of the reasons that it is worthwhile to mark 1833 is because the Day of Atonement began in 1844. And 10 years before that, and the Feast of the Lord. What comes 10 days before the Day of Atonement? The Feast of Trumpets, an announcement, a call to holy convocation, the falling of the stars, the ordination of William Miller, corresponds with this 10 year period that leads to the Day of Atonement. August 11th, 1840, we've talked about this is when the principle, the primary principle that William Miller was using to make his calculation which was the year date principle, which is illustrated all over this chart, was confirmed before the eyes of the world with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire on August 11, 1840. In the early part, I think it's March of 1842, the 1843 chart was published. Is it March, Wayne? Uh, I believe it was. Uh... The, it was late 42 that they had the conference. In, uh, we, I mean, it might be in the notes. I think okay. it's early uh, 42. Uh, I'm not even really willing to argue with you. This no, no, it was the conference that decided to uh, make the chart that was ratified. And, uh, Bates oversaw the uh, conference. He's the conference chairman. But actually, the May. In May, it's in the next page. Mar May of 1842. March 21st was the disappointment. Yeah, okay, in any case. In case, I, I'm, I'm sorry for, for bringing you in on that one. I was running out of time. In 1842, the 1843 chart is published. The reason I'm putting it up there is this is a waymark of that history. And the pioneers understood it to be a waymark of that history. Um, <clears throat> you'll see the quote from Early Writings, page 74, that we've referred to, that Sister White says, this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. On the 
bottom of page 53 of your notes. And if you turn to the next page, I'm just putting some way marks into place here. On the top of page 54, James White says this about this chart. It was the united testimony of Second Advent lectures and papers when standing on the original faith that the publication of the chart was a fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, verses 2 and 3. If the chart was a subject of prophecy, and those who deny it leave the original faith, then follows the eighth and the fourth of the seven. And he continues on. The point I'm making here is that when this chart arrives in the right history in 1842, it was on the fulfillment of prophecy of Habakkuk 2 and Ezekiel 12, 28. Ezekiel 20, 28. But in any case, <clears throat> my mind's getting kind of weary here. Ezekiel 12, verses 23 to 28. And it's one of the waymarks. And brothers and sisters, the reason that I'm sitting here is a waymark, if you follow the logic. If the chart here in this history is a waymark, it stands to reason that as this history is repeated, that God's people will once again be looking to this chart as a waymark. And we are. All right, we are. And it wasn't being dealt with as anything of any significance anywhere in Adventism 10 years ago. Just wasn't. In fact, now there are people all around planet Earth, Seventh-day Adventists, that are dealing with this chart as once again taking its place as a waymark of Adventism. That, that's the reason that we're putting it in there. You have a couple more quotes on the chart from Bates. Um, and then in June 1842, they, we've read this before, with few exceptions, the Protestant churches closed their doors on the Millerites. Then when 1843 arrives, you have the first disappointment. And the disappointment of 1843, they were predicting that the Lord was going to return in 1843. And when he didn't return in 1843, you have the first disappointment. But when does the disappointment arrive? 1844. Because they were functioning on the biblical reckoning of time, and they understood that 1843 ended on March 21st, 1844. So their first disappointment came on March 22nd, 1844. So when you consider these things, the first disappointment is in the beginning of 1844, the midnight cry comes in the summer of 1844, and the door closes in the autumn of 1844. You're in a very short period of time where these final wave arcs are taking place. Um, first and second message proclaimed in 1843 and 1844. Then, in, um, from the Exeter camp meeting, August 12th onward, you have the midnight cry. It reaches its climax on October 22nd, 1844. The manifestation of the power of God, as Sister White states in the following two quotes. And that's a basic rundown of the Millerite history and an argument that that history is represented in Revelation 14 and Revelation 10 and in Matthew 25. And those three lines of prophecy all teach the same things. They teach, number one, the history when they were fulfilled in the Millerite time period will be repeated at the end of the world. And they teach three different aspects of that history. The angels of Revelation 14 emphasize the work that is accomplished by God's people. So too, the angel of Revelation 18 emphasizing the work that is accomplished by God's people. Revelation 10 is emphasizing the role that Christ plays in all this because it is Christ that unseals this testing truth. And Matthew 25 emphasizes the experience of the Advent people. Could you run by me one more time your re reckoning of your uh, seven times the beginning of 1798? No, but I, I, I will. I'll tell you why. I have, I have, but as I dealt with the seven thunders based upon these two quotes, where Sister White says the seven thunders represent a delineation of events that transpired in the first and second angels' message, and then she also says represents future events that will be disclosed in their order. I have emphasized that. The seven thunders, if nothing else, are events. And then my argument is that in the, the structure of Revelation chapter 10, the history of Revelation chapter 10 is 1840 to 1844. Verse 1, the angel comes down in 1840. By verse 10, John has eaten the little book and it's bitter in his stomach, 1844. And, and you can show 1840 to 1844 within the chapter in other places, all right? Not just 
by the beginning verse and the ending verse. But the pioneers will tell you, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the pioneers tell you that the, the chapter difference between Revelation 10 and Revelation 11 is incorrect. They will tell you that you shouldn't end Revelation 10 until verse 2. Of Revelation 11? Yes. Verse 3. Verse 3? No, no, no. It, no it, could be, it could be verse 3, but I, I know that they make the distinction that, that you have to include verse 1 in it, because verse 1 if it is truly part of the testimony of Revelation 10, and I believe it is, I believe the pioneers were right on this. Verse 1 says, And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. So, part of the story of Revelation 10 is that in verse 10, John eats a little book and it's sweet in his mouth and it becomes bitter in his stomach, and he represents the Millerites. Right? But more importantly, more specifically, represents the 144,000 because in verses 8 and 9, he's told in advance of taking the little book and eating it. What's going to happen? Just go take the little book, and when you eat it, it's going to be sweet in your mouth and it's going to become bitter in your stomach. He goes through that, and he's illustrating both the Millerites and the 144,000. And then the, the final verse of chapter 10 says, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again. In other words, this history of the Millerites is going to be repeated again. But then verse 1, which is part of the chapter, says measure the temple of God. And sure enough, the Millerites had to measure the sanctuary. They had to come to understand what the sanctuary was after the disappointment because they thought it was the earth, and it wasn't. It was the heavenly sanctuary. But the 144,000, they have to measure the sanctuary too. But we don't have to measure the sanctuary to understand what the apartments and the furnishings are because we know that it's Seventh day Adventist. We have to measure the temple in a different way. And what we have to measure is the history of 1798 when the first 2520 ended and 1844 when the second time 2520 ended because this history of 46 years is where the spiritual temple is raised up from 1798 to 1844. So you can see the history of 1798 to 1844 in Revelation 10. That is not the only argument. But that's, that's a preliminary one. The main argument comes when you begin to deal with what the seven seals are and the opening of the seven seal. Because the seven seals get open three times. So we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, keeping us somewhat alert through this particular presentation. We know it's warm, and uh, we were digesting our, our meal. And we, we thank you for keeping us focused. We want to understand these truths. We want to see what you're speaking to us about the fact that the Millerite history is repeated at the end of the world. And we ask that you give us the ability to remember these things that we're studying so intensely for our very short period of time, but when we do return home, um, we will remember what we test and compare with your word. We ask for your continued presence throughout the coming meetings this day, and a blessing upon the entire time that we spend here. In Jesus' name. Amen.